Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for our first lecture in our fall 2022 lecture series. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, make sure to keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat and we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. And this lecture is going to be recorded. So um, we'll keep you posted on when it's up on our website and uh, our YouTube channel. And I think that is everything. So to get started um, on, the, on the lecture, uh, it's gonna be presented by bestselling author, Wynn Brown. And we just wanted to give her her flowers a little bit. Um, so she's again, a bestselling author of three books and has written for many newspapers and magazines on various topics from science to travel. Her book, The Forgotten Botanist, Sarah Plummer Lemon's Life of Science and Art was published in November, 2021. And this year has won three awards. And on top of that, she's a, um, a one-stop shop, pre-publication um, shop as a freelance writer, editor, and graphic designer. Hi, if you're coming in, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Um, she's um, a freelance writer, editor, and graphic designer, as well as an illustrator. So without further ado, I'll pass over the Zoom mic and share to Wynn to start the presentation. Thank you. Laura, thank you. That was great. I, uh, and let me see if I can share my screen, which is often kind of an adventure in Zoom land here. Um, so I'm hoping that you can see my title slide. Is that what you're looking at, Laura? Yes. Perfect. All right. Great. All right. Um, let's see. And let me make sure I can still advance slide. Yes. Um, so as, as uh, let me get rid of those. So as Laura mentioned, um, I'm a writer, a tutorial, and graphic designer, and I'm very happy to be here. It's a real honor, and it's such a kick to be here, virtual at least, in Oakland, which was so important to Sarah Lemon. I am, so I, I really appreciate the invitation. And basically, you know, I think of myself as a three-legged stool. Uh, these are a few of the books and other projects that I've worked on as a writer, editor, illustrator, designer, or project manager, or some combination of all of those. My background is a mix of journalism, biology, and scientific illustration. But, you know, really overall, I think of myself primarily as a storyteller. To me, stories are the connective tissue that attach us to our land or to our forebears or even to our entire culture, whether that be local or global. And you can see more about the tools that I use to tell those stories at my website. And not surprisingly, that's winbrown.com. And also not surprisingly, of all of the projects on the previous slide, the one that I'm proudest of is this one. This particular story of the forgotten botanist connects both art and science. And it's been incredibly thrilling to see it arrive after seven years gestation. The book has been out for almost a year. It came out in November. And I'm very pleased to tell you it's done well. And in fact, the entire first printing sold out in six months. And as Laura pointed out, it's won several awards. So this evening, uh, what we'll do is first I'll give you a brief overview of the project itself, kind of the story behind Sarah's story. Then I'm gonna zip through a bare bones timeline of Sarah's packed, really amazingly productive life. And tonight's presentation will be an extra bare bones because I wanna focus more on, on her artwork and the very recent discovery just four weeks ago of more of her paintings that we didn't know about. And this is work that many of us thought had been lost in the fires that followed the San Francisco earthquake. And for some of the paintings that you'll see tonight, this is the very first time that they've been seen in public since, I don't know, the late 1800s. I'll, we'll also look at a few of the plants that Sarah collected and or ones that were named for. Um, and I will also, uh, as soon as I grab it, remember to read a selection from the book. And then to wrap up, you'll see what's next for, for the Sarah Lemon project, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So when I started all this, I 
had no idea what I was getting myself into. It's hard to believe that it was 20 years ago that I first learned that Arizona's Mount Lemon is named for a woman botanist of the 1800s who climbed it on her honeymoon in her 40s. That was pretty intriguing. Then 10 years ago in 2012, I learned that that the Berkeley archives, the Jepson University of California and Jepson Herbaria archives at Berkeley had six linear feet of material uh, on John and Sarah Lemon. And I thought, hmm, somebody should do a book. Well, I now know they're live monsters among those words. <laughs> it turns out that much of that six feet was letters, many, many letters. Talk about a gift to historians. Sarah was very close to her family. She wrote home almost every week, mostly to her father and to her sister, Maddie, or Martha Plummer. I made three trips to the Berkeley archives and I photographed all 1200 pages of those letters. I then moved them onto my hard drive and read them all. And sometimes that was kind of challenging as you can see from this slide. Sarah was, I would say a frugal type and to save paper, she often wrote across her own writing. And that was quite common at the time because paper was expensive and it's called cross writing, but it does sometimes make it a little challenging to read. So this slide gets us a little deeper into the Plummer family history. You already know about Sarah's sister, Maddie, who married a man whose last name was Everett. Well, Maddie had a daughter who would be Sarah's niece and confusingly, she was also called Maddie. Maddie Jr. married a man named Saint, whose last name was St. John and they had a son, Harold St. John, who you can see here. He grew up to be a noted botanist in Hawaii. And when his mother, Maddie Jr. died, boxes of Sarah's paintings and letters ended up stored in his attic in Hawaii. When he died, his granddaughter, Amy St. John, did the best she could to conserve the material carefully. She had it shipped from Honolulu to California. And then in 2015, she donated all that material to the archives at Berkeley and different boxes were stored in, in different areas within the facility. And here are two of those boxes. These two boxes, which um, are, you know, maybe, oh, they're 18 by 12 inches wide, contain 276 paintings. They're all watercolors on paper. And because of both their age and Hawaii's humidity, they are so fragile that the archivists were even, uh, they were even afraid to count them. They didn't even know how many were in the box because they were afraid that they would just crumble. So in 2016, when this picture was taken, we all thought that that was all that had been found of Sarah's artwork. And as of last month, we now know we were wrong and I'll get back to that. But to me, it was really tragic that these exquisite and incredibly fragile watercolors on paper were squished into these two small boxes with no protective sheets in between. And of course, times being what they are in the academic world, the archives had no money to do anything with them. Plus, of course, the real thing was I was dying to see what was in those boxes. So a year later, in order to get photographs for the book that I had not yet written and didn't even have a contract for, I hired a local art conservator for a day. And that was Susan Filter. It was one very, very long day. At that point, we didn't know how many pieces there were in the box. So Susan and my husband, Dave Peterson, and I spent hours listing and photographing every one of those 276 pieces, front and back, because there's often a wealth of information written on the back of many of them, or there's a second painting. 20 of the, these paintings are reproduced in the book, and I'm happy to say that, that the publisher reproduced them in color. I mentioned earlier that these paintings had been stored in Hawaii and that much of the artwork is too fragile to handle. And I think this is this particular image is, makes that pretty clear. This is some really horrific insect damage. And the day that I saw that, I resolved that somehow I really wanted to make it possible for these delicate and exquisite works to be stored more safely. And this isn't really called art restoration, the accurate technical term for this is called stabilizing and rehousing the artwork so that it won't deteriorate anymore. 
So then I had to figure out how I was going to do this book. And I'll spare you most of the nuts and bolts detail about book publication, because that's a that's a whole different talk, except to say that because it's nonfiction, publishers require a book proposal. And book proposals are actually almost as much work as the eventual manuscript. My book proposal is 100 pages. Over the next two years, I submitted it to 24 different agents, commercial publishers, and academic presses. And in October 2019, I signed a contract with the University of Nebraska Press, who should have been number one on my list. They are, they've been absolutely fantastic to work with. The whole process has been wonderful. And I'm especially pleased that it's a bison book, which is their trade imprint for general interest readers. And then I wrote the book. And as you can see, I have excellent office help. A year after submitting the final manuscript, UPS made a delivery and a real honest to gosh actual books, which was just incredibly exciting. But 2022 has not stopped being exciting. Um, thanks to an especially generous donation from the Sabino Canyon Volunteer Naturalists here in Tucson, along with some other donations. And then I also donated all my speaking fees and honoraria. Because of that, there was enough funding for us to return to Berkeley and to cover Susan Filter's fee. And bless her, she came out of retirement to do this work and to cover all the materials for rehousing those 276 works. And then the most amazing thing happened. Two more boxes showed up that had been stored elsewhere in the herbarium. So this top photo over here shows the two original boxes on the bottom shelf um, and then the two new ones, totaling more than 200 paintings that we had, not, that we had never seen. In the lower left image, you can see Amy Kassemeyer, the, who's the herbarium archivist, uh, Susan Filter, the conservator, Amy St. John, who, and it was such a kick working with her. She is Sarah's great, great grandniece and my husband, Dave. So it was, uh, it was quite, quite the adventure doing this. Here uh, in the back, you can see Amy uh, Kassemeyer, it's confusing having two Amy's, recording the dimensions of each piece. Amy St. John is preparing to measure the next one while Susan is inserting glassine sheets between the paintings and then stacking them gently in archival quality folders. The folders will then get stacked in these boxes, which you see back here. And in the meantime, Dave was making paper labels with numbers and I was photographing each painting with its number. It took all five of us a solid three days to go through all 495 pieces of art. And we didn't get through all of them because we just didn't have time. So let's dive a little deeper into the story of the woman behind all this work, Sarah Allen Plummer Lemon, for whom Arizona's own Mount Lemon is named. She was born in New Gloucester, Maine on September 3rd, 1836. So uh, she, this year she would have been 186 years old. She was the middle child of five. You already know about her younger sister, Maddie. And she also had two older brothers and one younger one. Here you can see Maddie uh, on the left and father, Micah Jaw Sawyer Plummer. And in those 1,200 pages of letters, there's only one from Sarah directly to her mother, Betsy Haskell Plummer. And all I know about that is that Betsy had some significant health problems. At the age of 20, Sarah left home to attend the Ladies Collegiate Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts, where she earned a certificate in teaching calisthenics. And that was what these days we call gym. That's really ironic because Sarah's health had always been kind of precarious. She'd always had colds and, and bronchitis. So it's ironic that she would be teaching gym class of all things. In 1861, she moved to Brooklyn, New York. She graduated from the Greenleaf Institute with honors and she was doubly certified in chemistry and physics. In 1862, she was accepted to the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. And there she studied chemistry and physics at night. And during the day, she, she again taught calisthenics. And she also taught private art lessons because she had always been artistic. 
She absolutely loved her life in New York City. She was constantly busy teaching, soaking up the intellectual and artistic opportunities. And in a really interesting bit of foreshadowing, she also made time to volunteer at New York's Bellevue Hospital as a nurse for wounded Civil War soldiers. And this is where she may have crossed paths with Clara Barton for the first time. And of course, Clara Barton would go on to establish the American Red Cross. Again, it's very ironic given Sarah's own fragile health that she would work in a hospital. And she again had terrible respiratory problems, constant colds. And then in 1863, she nearly died of measles. In 1870, she nearly died again, this time of pneumonia. And she realized that her life depended on escaping the bitter Northeastern winters. She made the huge decision to move across the country all by herself to California, where she didn't know a soul. This was not an easy jaunt. The railroad wasn't reliable yet, particularly for a single woman. So she went the long way around, the really long way around by steamship through Panama. She finally disembarked in San Francisco where she stayed for a month before realizing that her lungs were still really not up to the Bay Area's cold and damp. So she headed south to Santa Barbara. And when she got there, it is still 1870, the population was 2,970, a little, little bit different than it is now. Santa Barbara was lovely. The climate was idyllic, especially compared to Manhattan. But the intellectual stimulation was a very far cry from New York City. And this is when she wrote to her sister, Maddie, it is like death to me to be idle, which almost became the title for the book. And worse yet, there was no library in town. So being Sarah, she rounded up donations and hundreds of books, and she established Santa Barbara's first library. It was also a stationery store where she could sell art supplies and music and newspapers. As she recovered her health, she took long walks along the beach and in the hills above Santa Barbara. She'd always been insatiably curious. She taught herself botany by using her artistic ability. This is the earliest surviving painting. It's most likely some kind of flowering fruit tree, possibly an apple. And those brown spots that you see on it are called foxing. They may possibly be fungus damage from the humidity in Hawaii, or they might possibly be tiny fragments of rust from when the paper was manufactured. Sarah still missed the stimulation of New York City, so she also set up a lecture series, and that may be what brought this man to Santa Barbara. John Gill Lemon, who usually went by J.G. Lemon, was born in Michigan in 1832, four years before Sarah. He became a teacher, and then he became the county superintendent of schools. He had started attending classes at the University of Michigan, but then he enlisted in the Union Army in the Civil War in June 1862. He was in 32 battles in between working as an Army nurse, and then he was captured in August of 1864. He was later sent to both the Florence Stockade in South Carolina and also the infamous Andersonville Prison in Georgia. The photo on the left is J.G. Lemon, but the one on the right is not. But the one on the right is, is typical of what the few survivors of Andersonville looked like when, if they survived. J.G. was released in 1865 at the end of the war, and he wrote later that after a year of liberal diet, his weight increased to 90 pounds. And this was a man of six feet tall. With his mother's help, and she's quite the story herself, J.G. moved to Northern California to convalesce at his brother's home in Sierra Valley, north of Truckee. J.G. had always been interested in botany, and so he started learning the Western plants. The ones he didn't know, he sent to Harvard University's Dr. Asa Gray. And Dr. Asa Gray, as many of you know, was the preeminent American botanist. And this particular painting, I had to sneak in a painting, um, is by Sarah, and it was one of the ones that she did soon after she and, and John joined forces. This is the label that she wrote on the bottom of the painting. 
Um, and it's interesting that she says the above wonderful five leaf clover when first recognized and discovered by J.G. Lemon as new to the botanic world, because it's named for him, it was a new species, was growing in abundance in the Sierra Valley region in 1866 and was declared by stockmen and farmers to be one of the best native forage plants of the high Sierras. And this is what the plant looks like. Um, and uh, sadly, it's now listed as vulnerable by the California Fish and Wildlife and the IUCN and California Native Plant Society listed as rare and endangered. As a side note, I'm pleased to tell you that I've been invited to be part of an arts festival in Sierra Valley next weekend, and we're actually going to be staying at that very same ranch. So you can count on the fact I'm going to be crawling around on the ground looking for this five-leaf clover. I call this my bounty of mostly bearded botanist slide. It, you could think of it as a, as a plantary system with all of these botanists orbiting around Asa Gray. And it helps to have a little context of what was happening in, in the world of botany in the 1870s. This was a time of frenetic botanic activity. All these men were in frequent communication with one another. And any of you who are gardeners will recognize many of their names as species names for the plants that are in your garden. By this time, Sarah Plummer had educated herself to become a very knowledgeable amateur botanist. And both she and JG corresponded with all of these men frequently as well. Some years later, she and JG would spend much of their time socializing with John Muir and Charles Perry. In 1876, J.G. showed up at Santa Barbara, most likely at a lecture at Sarah's library, two years after this picture was taken. And he's not exactly a slouch in the whiskers department either. Like Sarah, he too had terrible health issues, but his were because of his POW experiences. And it really sounds as if he had post-traumatic stress disorder from the, just the horrific treatment in prison. But the two of them started botanizing together in the hills above Santa Barbara. JG became smitten with Sarah to the point where when she discovered a new plant that nobody could identify, he asked Asa Gray to name it for her. And to this day, it's still called Plumber's Baccarus in honor of her maiden name. A year later, he worked up the courage to propose to her and she turned him down. She said she loved him deeply. She felt that they were just both too sick too often to marry. So they remained affectionate pen pals for the next several years. Then Sarah got sick yet again, at this time with spinal meningitis, and this was in 1880, and she nearly died. And apparently that may have changed her mind because on Thanksgiving Day, 1880, they were married. Or as Sarah described it to Maddie, they, quote, plunged into the matrimonial vortex. I love that. She was 44, he was 48. She relocated from Santa Barbara to Oakland and moved in with JG and his mother, which fortunately worked out well. Everybody got along fine. They resolved at Sarah's suggestion that, as JG wrote later, that instead of, quote, idling our time in useless saunterings and listening to silly gossip, they would delay their honeymoon until the growing season when they would, quote, make a grand botanical raid into Arizona and try to touch the heart of Santa Catalina. So here's a map um, of where they were. This is southern, southern Arizona. You can see that this, these are the Santa Catalina Mountains here and Mount Lemmon. And then you'll hear more about the Chiricahua Mountains, which are here, and the Huachucas. So in April in 1881, they arrived in Tucson by train and they set up camp in the foothills north of what we now call Fort Lowell. And at that point, it really was a, um, a fort. They spent two weeks struggling to get to the top of the range from the south side and failed three times. And I think this slide makes it pretty obvious why they would fail. It's really, really rugged country. And I'm gonna read a little bit from the book here. The couple deliberately planned their trip for spring, one of Southern Arizona's two prime times for botany. The second being late summer when the monsoon storms reawaken the parched desert. 
Sarah's artist eye, accustomed to coastal New England and California, was astonished. Green, tr green trunked Palo Verde trees showered the ground with golden blossoms. Bright yellow brittle bush still flowered in the shade. The long witch's arms of the Ocotillo stretched toward the sky with scarlet fingertips and barrel cactuses were studded with brilliant orange blooms. Even the wildlife was bizarre. Gambles quail chittered, their ridiculous top knots bobbling as their call of cuidado, cuidado, warned thumb-sized youngsters of Cooper's hawk swooping through on a speedy and often lethal ambush. One long-tailed bird didn't fly, but ran past their campsite, and a large pink and black beaded lizard lumbered along the wash, its shiny, leathery tongue licking up unwary ants. Odder yet, the serpents wore rattles, and they were not afraid to shake them in warning. Creeks lined with green carpets of sedges and punctuated with hop bushes still trickled clear with snowmelt and the descending trill of an occasional canyon wren reverberated off canyon walls. At night, coyote choruses woke the lemons, alerting them to the scuttle of skunks in search of any escaped food scraps among the dry leaf litter. The magnificent yet improbably comical sentinel saguaros, home to Gila woodpeckers and gilded flickers, towered over it all. Day after day, Sarah and J.G. scrambled up and down steep cliffs and ravines among plants that seemed determined to draw blood. Opuncha spines, cat claw thorns, yucca spears, agave bayonets. They dodged the bundles of prickly fallen teddy bear choya while always keeping a watchful eye out for the rumored Apaches. They each lugged water, a little food, plant presses for flowers and leaves, and wads of damp rags to wrap and preserve any prized and fragile ferns they might find. At first, it was all such a contrast to the cool fogs of the Bay Area that Sarah paused frequently to inhale the essence of the desert, to savor the sun's heat penetrating that olive green broadcloth, and to allow her eyes to stretch over the vast expanse. Each evening, the sun sank behind the jagged Tucson Mountains to the southwest, hunkered Baba Kivari Peak. The Santa Ritas underlined the southern horizon, and dawn broke behind the Rincons. Further east were the Whetstone Mountains and Tombstone, where the shootout at the OK Corral would occur a few, just a few months later. But spring is short in the desert. As the days wore on, daytime temperatures rose until the heat was torrid. The closest spring, three quarters of a mile away, shrank to a dribble so small the honeymoon couple had to squeeze their rubber drinking cups into crevices to get any water at all. They found a tiny cave halfway up the mountain and made numerous trips to ferry all the gear so they'd be closer to the top, their ultimate destination. The days grew even hotter the terrain more rugged. And yet, both of them were deeply happy, exclaiming joyously to each other as they found what they called new glories, an unknown agave here, a mystery mallow there, and busily spent every evening pressing, packing, and labeling the day's finds. They gathered seeds of one attractive bush with deeply dissected and particularly pungent leaves to plant back at their Oakland herbarium. Later, Asa Gray named it to Gettys Lemoni, or Lemons Marigold. Eventually, it would become the stock that still supplies nurseries nationwide. Each day, they covered a different route, thinking this one would wind its way to the top of the mountain. Each day, they'd end up peering down a 500-foot deep ravine or hopelessly up at an unclimbable cliff. Three times they set out on paths that surely aimed for the summit, and each one dwindled into yet another dead end in terrain much too rugged to cross. Finally, one afternoon, they reached a point high enough they could see another ridge topped by the true upper peaks, which were invisible from the desert below. Between them and the peaks was, quote, an abyss 2,000 feet deep and twice as far across 
that everywhere separated us from the main mountain. There was no help for it. We must return, baffled, J.G. wrote later. Beneath us yawned the chasm. Beyond and far, far above stood the guardian pinnacle between which lay the narrow saddle through which we could not pass. After two weeks of rugged field work and three blisteringly hot attempts to reach the top, both Sarah and JG were exhausted and they were nearing the end of their supplies. Yet they still were not completely defeated. They lugged their equipment back down the hot rocky slopes and returned to town to rest up. They talked to locals who suggested the other side of the range should be more accessible. So one of the locals that they talked to was the man you saw the, in the earlier slide, Emerson Oliver Stratton, and he owned the Pandora Ranch on the north side of the Catalinas. He knew he'd never been to the top, but he knew of a route that he thought would work, and plus he had pack animals. And years later, he wrote, quote, we went to the highest peak of the Santa Catalinas and christened it Mount Lemon in honor of Mrs. Lemon, who was the first white woman up there. The following year, 1882, they returned to Arizona, and this time based in Fort Huachuca, where they spent several months. And, and those of you who've read the book know that they thought of this as just a really true botanical paradise. And this is the time and place where Sarah did what we thought were most of the surviving paintings. And now, or at least until last month, we thought they were the surviving paintings. They absolutely loved it. And um, this is a picture of Fort Lowell or Fort Huachuca in the 1880s. And they they camped always within shouting distance of, of the fort because of the Apaches. And Sarah wrote to her family, I wish you could see our rough outfit of two gray rubber blankets, old flannel vests and drawers, old boots and hats, a big lunch basket filled with corned beef, crackers, cheese, and three or four jars of nice currant jelly brought in by good, thoughtful friends. One of the things I love about Sarah is that she cares about food. So there are many, many plants that, that have the, the word lemon in the species name, lemon eye. And I'm gonna show you a few of, that, are, that are named specifically for Sarah. Um, but it's also really important to remember that in 1884, Asa Gray published a paper in which he made it clear, and he said, whenever the name of lemon is cited for Arizonian plants, it in fact refers to the pair of most enthusiastic botanists. So here's one that's named for Sarah. Um, it's a little cliff fern, and she was the one to collect it first in September 1881. And I'm... Um, Let's see, and, and this is a, a morning glory, and you'll see a painting later. I don't know if it's of this species or not, but this one is also, you can see the species name, Plumeray. And this is a, a stevia, same group of plants that you use to sweeten your tea. And this one is, is a garlic. Um, and still, all these years later, it's still called Allium plumeri, and this one was in the Huachucas in 1882. And this one is a California plant, because just because I live in Arizona, I wanted to make sure I got some California plants for you this evening. This one is a mariposa lily that's named for her, and it's native to California. Um, and it's a quite, quite an unusual plant. And I'm thrilled to say that among the new paintings that we hadn't seen before is her painting of Plummer's Mariposa Lily. And it says Calicordus plumera, um, new species. And Sarah was always very modest, but I think that there must have been a smile on her face as she made that label. And let's see. So this next one uh, is not named for Sarah, but it's another specimen that was actually collected by her from the Huachucas. And we were actually able to see this very specimen when we visited Nebraska. It's in the Nebraska State Museum. And it's a nettle spurge called Giotrova macroriza. Um, and the label is in Sarah's very distinctive handwriting. And I can tell you that after reading 1,200 pages of her letters, I'm really familiar with her handwriting. Um, 
You'll also notice that in their botanical labels down here at the bottom, it always says JG, Lemon, and Wife. Um, I will spare you the feminist rant, except to say that that was very typical of the times. And there are quite a few experts who believe that it was actually Sarah who did much of the botanical work that was credited to JG because his war wounds were just so devastating. And here's the, that plant in, in real life. Um, it's, this is, it's a tall, handsome plant. That one is about waist high. And here's Sarah's painting of it. Um, and you can see that it was done in Fort Huachuca in either June or July, 1882. This one is actually in the book. And you can also see that there's some foxing on it. The following year, they returned to Arizona. This time they went to both the Catalina Mountains and the Huachucas. Sarah wrote that they stayed on the Cactus Ranch, which was north of Tucson, but they were poisoned by the well water. So they wanted to move on to Fort Huachuca where they'd been the previous year, but there was an outbreak of yellow fever. So instead they, they stayed at the ranch called the Igo Ranch at the north end of the Huachucas. And I was tremendously excited to find this painting I am in the new batch because this one, she's labeled it on the back. She signed it and said, painted in the Santa Catalina region, 1883. And I mentioned that often there's a wealth of, of information on the back. Sarah always wrote on the back of the paintings in very pale pencils. So there was no risk of ink bleeding through to the image, um, which was great 140 years ago, but it makes it a little challenging now. But sometimes what I was able to do is to move the image into Photoshop, bump up the contrast, change the color temperature to try to, to enhance this writing to make it a little bit easier to read. And so you can see the scientific name, Ingenhousia Triloba, uh, Santa Catalina Region, September 1883, and her signature, Mrs. S.A.P. Lemon. Ingenhousia is now actually spelled with a Z. So, and that's one of the challenges because this, the plants have often changed their scientific names since the 1800s. Here's another of the new paintings. Uh, this is Pringles Cluster Vine. And I should also add here, I am absolutely not a botanist. So sometimes I may mispronounce the names and anybody who has botanical corrections is more than welcome to send them to me. Here's the actual plant um, that she illustrated on the previous slide. And here's what she has said on, on the back. And in the red, it says Santa Catalina Mountains, September 1883, SAP Lemon, the scientific name, Box Canyon, Santa Catalina Mountains, September 3rd, 1883. And then she refers to the purple Epomea. And Epomea is the, the morning glory. And you remember I mentioned that when I showed you the earlier slide. So here's one of my favorite flowers. This is the Mexican star. And in this case, she's painted it in combination with blue gramma grass. And when you look at the back, you know, there's a lot of, of information. Um, and I'm, for some reason, she cut this off. I'd, I'd love to know what this says because it's about the Ruellia, which is another really interesting plant. But she says, white flowers, Mila by Flora, Igo's Ranch, Huachuca Mountains, September 18th and signs it Mrs. S.A.P. Lemon. And then she mentions fringe grass, Budaloa oligostichus, um, and that's what we now call blue gramma. And here's what the plant looks like. Here's another California plant. This one is in the book. It's California cream cups. Um, and um, let's see, and here is the actual plant. In May of 1884, they were on the train for, uh, from California going to Arizona, and they happened to meet a man named John Willard Young. And he was actually the son of Brigham Young, who'd built Fort Moroni, and he invited them to stay at his ranch. They remained his, remained his guests much of the summer, and this is the Indian paintbrush that, that Sarah painted while there. Uh, on the back, she wrote Kendricks Mountain, Northern Arizona, 1884. And one reason they were in Northern Arizona is because they were on the way to what was then known as the World's Industrial and Cotton Centennial Expedi Exposition, which is a really long way of saying 
the New Orleans World's Fair. Sarah was in charge of organizing the Pacific Slope section um, of, the, of the entire exhibit. They spent six months there and they spent most of their spare time hanging out with Clara Barton and her field agent, Dr. Julian Hubble. And another of the finds in this one of the boxes of new paintings is this beautifully hand lettered certificate saying, um, showing that Mrs. J.G. Lemon has been appointed commissioner of the Women's Department of the California Exhibit um, at the World's Fair. So that was very, just really exciting to find that. Here's another highlight in the lives of these supposedly frail couple. Astoundingly, they decided to become homesteaders. And thanks to the wonders of the internet, I was able to locate a map of their actual claim uh, near Shalam, California. And Dave and I traveled there back in the before times in 2019. And in a stroke of good luck and timing, which, and I like to refer to those as serendipity, we were able to get permission to walk this, this land. And I had read about the spring uh, where they had want, where they camped and they wanted to build a cabin. And the spring the rancher showed us is right here. So we were actually in the very spot uh, right near this dead walnut. Um, they set up the first, when they first got there, they set up camp in a canvas tent. And the second day they were there, they went off to get firewood and someone set fire to their whole camp and burned almost everything they had. I mentioned that Sarah was a frugal type and she saved the paper uh, that she could and wrote home on it. And this is a sketch of the of the shed that the, or the cabin that they eventually built. They ordered wood from San Luis Obispo and by hand, they built a 10 by 12 cabin. And so she wrote her, her family about it. And there's a little illustration here. From then on, generally, they were out in the field during the growing season collecting plants. They then spent winters at their herbarium in Oakland, eking out a living by selling specimens and seeds to collectors. They produced several books, Ill all Ill <coughs> excuse me, illustrated by Sarah, and they did frequent botany lectures. Here you can see a picture of their herbarium. This always makes me feel better about the mess in my office. And in 1903, they packed up everything and moved to what would become their last home. And this is the final home of the Lemon Herbarium, and it's on Telegraph Avenue, 5985 <clears throat> Telegraph Avenue. Remarkably, the house is still there. It could use a little love, um, but it's it's right next door to over here on the right is Steele's Scuba uh, Store. And this picture was taken in 2021. Sarah remained passionate about healthcare. She was very active in the Red Cross and she wrote the history of the Pacific Slope Red Cross. That was really no small accomplishment. It's 486 pages with dozens and dozens of photos. I also discovered that she quietly established the first training school for nurses on the West Coast, yet, she never even mentioned that in any of her letters that, that have shown up so far anyway. She was a frequent speaker about the importance of forest conservation, and she often spoke at women's suffrage events. And as Californians all know, they most Californians believe that her most well-known accomplishment was in 1903 after a 10-year battle when the golden poppy was named California's state flower. Arizonas might tell you that it's a bigger thing to have a mountain named for you, but we can argue about that later. In June of 1905, the Lemons returned to Tucson. They hunted up Emerson Stratton, and the following month, the three of them retraced their steps on five boroughs in honor of J.G. and Sarah's 25th anniversary. This is a postcard that, that she sent home to her family, and it's a little hard to read, um, but she says, both well and happy on this, our silver wedding journey. We sleep in the open air beside a delicious mountain stream that sings our nightly lullaby. Sarah was about 70 and JG was 74. 
So by now she had made hundreds and hundreds of paintings. And the question is, where are they? And I'm afraid I'm, I may have an answer to part of that question. Sarah was the second female member of what was until then the all-male California Academy of Sciences. She was then the first woman allowed to speak to the group. And after breaking that barrier, she was at the Academy Herbarium, frequently storing plants, labeling plants, finding plants. And, and she, in their letters, both she and JG often mentioned sending their specimens there, as well as many of her illustrations. And of course, as you all well know, at 5.12 a.m. on April 18th, the San Francisco earthquake convulsed the Bay Area and beyond. And as if the earthquake wasn't enough, fires gutted the California Academy of Sciences. I still believe that much of Sarah's work may have gone up in flames there, but I'm ecstatic to have been proven partially wrong and that, that there was more art that survived than we knew about. She wrote her family, we are safe, though tremendously shaken. And both Sarah and JG were shattered by the loss of so much of their work. JG's health, which was already fragile, continued to decline over the next year, and he lost much of his vision. In November of 1908, he died of pneumonia two days before their 28th wedding anniversary. After JG was gone, Sarah never really recovered. In fact, Maddie believed that Sarah's cognitive decline really began with the trauma of the earthquake. The family finally decided to commit Sarah to, Sarah, to Stockton State Hospital on April 22nd, 1916. Ironically, April 22nd would years later become Earth Day. The diagnosis was dementia. It was terribly sad. I, she became what they called profane and this incredibly distinguished, elegant, brilliant woman had to be prevented from leaving her house unclad, as they said. She died January 15th, 1923, 99 years ago. And the two of them are buried together in Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland under a gravestone that reads partners in botany. And I, I love this picture. Because of COVID, I couldn't get back to Oakland to photograph the headstone. So Sarah's great, great grandniece, Amy St. John, took this photo for the book. So what about Sarah's artistic legacy? Some of her illustrations are in the books that the two of them produced together, but they're all, of course, reproduced in black and white because it was way too expensive to do color in those days. Interestingly, this particular book is copyrighted uh, in Sarah's name. So her beautiful color paintings are reproduced in black and white. You can see this is one of them. You can see her signature down here. Uh, this is a narrow leaf pine from one of JG's books about pines of the Pacific Slope. And here's another reproduction from a different book. This one uh, is from his handbook of the Western Cone Bearers, published in July of 1900. And again, you can see your signature here. And I looked at all the black and white reproductions and all of his books, and I was just yearning to know what had happened to the originals. And here's one of them. This was in one of the boxes, the new boxes, and this is the tamarack pine. Uh, this is the original painting for that reproduction that you saw previously. Uh, it's what we now call the lodgepole pine. Here's another reproduction. This is Perry's nut pine. Um, and again, from uh, one of JG's books. And I'm thrilled to say here is the original painting. You can see her, um, her signature here. Um, this, this particular one was a species that they went to Mexico to find. And she wrote an article for the San Diego newspaper. Um, and that's in the book. One thing you'll notice about this is that the, the illustrations, the paintings that are on the dark paper are very fragile. This The acid level in the dark paper doesn't age well. And when I photographed it, it would have been good if I had just kind of maybe very gently moved that piece uh, off the label. Um, so the ones on dark paper are particularly fragile. 
And you can see, you can see that one in this one, this poor painting. Uh, we tried in every way possible to, we certainly didn't bend it, but even in just very carefully lifting it on a, another sheet, they crack. I was curious to see what this smear up here was. So if you move it into Photoshop and you blow it up, it says Mrs. S.A.P. Lemon. This is a date, but your guess is as good as mine. It might be 1888, and it, this might be November, but I'm not sure we will ever know. This one is an evening primrose, Enothera trichocalyx. Um, and this one is um, near Fort Mojave, and here's a, an enlargement of the label, Enothera trichocalyx, Colorado River near Fort Mojave. And this is, is JG's handwriting, but he's written Mrs. JG Lemon here that's kind of disappeared off to the edge. I could very happily keep you here all night looking at paintings because I they've been keeping me up way too late, but I do want to save some time for questions. So this is the last one that I'm going to show you. Um, this is, I did tell you I'm not a botanist, and so all I can tell you about this one from looking at the front is it's a magnolia, probably. It's a kind of a mystery magnolia to me, but when you turn it over, look what's on the back. We have words up here at the top and a really lovely little study and foliage at the bottom. So let's look a little more closely at that. Um, and down at the bottom, it does say study and foliage. And I think this is just really exquisite here. And at the top, it says, study in light and shadows, Magnolia Grandiflora, Oakland City Hall Park. And then you can see her signature, Mrs. JGL. And, I, and I, I did look up the City Hall and you all know way more about this than I do, but I gather it's been rebuilt since she did this. There's no date. Um, but I'm very curious to know if there's still a magnolia outside the city hall. So what's next? Now that the book is out, some people might think I should be done with Sarah by now. But actually, all along, I've really thought of this as, um, as a project, not just a book. And it now appears with all the, the with the discovery of all these new paintings that Sarah and I are going to be joined together for quite some time. And my husband, Dave, says he feels as if he's married two women, both Sarah and me. And so phase two um, is going to last a little longer than, than I had thought. Phase two was supposed to be rehousing those initial 276 paintings. Right now, phase two is on hold um, because we went through the, the funding that we had, those donations. Um, and uh, if you have any suggestions about agencies, foundations, interest groups, individuals who would like to collaborate and make donations to support the rehousing, do let me know. Um, and um, I'll I'll post my email at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. And Laura could maybe put it in the chat box. It's win at winbrown.com. Um, and let's see. So phase three, the initiatives would be to continue the promotional activities. There are several botanical illustration groups who are really excited about this project. There are other people who are pulling together curriculum materials for kids about and using botany and Sarah's story to teach kids about scientific illustration or botany. Um, I would love to see an online catalog of her work uh, you can do a printed one, but they're hideously expensive, as you can imagine, with the printing at high resolution. But an online catalog would be would make her work accessible to ev anybody everywhere for free. And I've also thought that it would be great to do digital reproductions of her paintings. They're too fragile to travel. But if we could do digital reproductions and then restore those reproductions so we didn't touch the originals, so that people could see what these might have looked like in 140 years ago. So various ideas are starting to happen. And if you have any other ideas, do please let me know. And if you'd like to be kept informed about the project, I send out a sporadic newsletter. Each one has snippets about Sarah. It's free. 
I only send it out if I have something to announce. And it's also easy to unsubscribe if you decide it's just not your thing. Um, and again, if you email me at win at winbrown.com, I can go ahead and add you as a subscriber. So the book is available wherever you buy books. Um, I've been encouraging people to support local independent bookstores. We were lucky enough to go to Moe's in Berkeley a few uh, a couple of weeks ago. What a great place. Um, and any, any of the independent bookstores can either have it in stock or can order it for you. Um, and if you've already got a book um, or you order it and you would like it signed, um, what I can do is send you a book plate that looks like this and I'll, I'll sign it. What you'll need to do is send me your snail mail address um, and it doesn't cost anything and tell me if you want me simply to autograph it or inscribe it to somebody. So that's where the Sarah Lemon Project is, at least for now. And I really hope you agree with me that Sarah is really another, another hidden figure of both science and art. She richly deserves a mountain in her name and a book, and that she really deserve her work really deserves to be preserved. Thank you again, Allison, for inviting me. And at this point, I'm very happy to unshare my screen if I can remember how to do that and take any questions. I'm gonna stop share and we'll see. Laura, did that work? I think it worked. Yeah, it worked. Um, so I have found one question and it may have already been answered in the course of the lecture. Um, uh, Richard Cowan says he's also interested in exactly where she lived and worked in Oakland. Um, she was at, they were at various addresses. Um, the final one was 5985 on Telegraph Avenue. Um, and that was the, the picture of the house that I showed. They were also on, um, I think it was called Blake Street. And then they were also on, is there a street called Cliff Street? I'd have to, I'd have to look back in the book. They, they rented most of the time and often they were, they were always short on money. And one of the places they were in was in this death trap. It was on the third floor and they had to save up all their errands to try to do in one day because neither one of them could make it very well up and down the stairs. Um, and it only had one staircase, so they were terrified of fire. So it was, um, they were only there in the, in the winter because during the growing season, they were always camping and always out in the field. I hope that helps. Okay. Um, Lisa Heyer says, sadly, no magnolias at the current city hall anymore. Wonderful talk, thanks. And I'd like to add that the, the city hall, it's an oak, it's not a magnolia but it, it's a very beautiful oak that was transplanted from North Oakland by uh, Jack London's widow after his death. So it's grown very large there. Oh, I must correct that because a few years ago, Anna Lee Allen and I and Open Heritage Alliance did a rededication of the Jack London Oak. And while there was often belief that his widow was involved, she doesn't seem to have been. Oh, uh, really? But the civic leaders uh, moved the sapling from Mosswood. Mosswood uh, Park, yeah. To, uh, to the front of City Hall um, as recognition for various things, including the fact that Jack London had run for mayor of Oakland a couple times as a labor socialist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so our, you know, our roots in, uh, uh, it's very appropriate that uh, Sarah, uh, that Sarah had roots in Oakland, and uh, I grew up in the Mojave Desert. So, and my father lives in Arizona now. So, I must get your book. I can't wait. This was <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. But be sure to to let me know if you'd like a signed book plate for it. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. That's one fascinating more. Fascinating about the about the city hall because. Um, I, as I said, I'm just going through these paintings for the first time and it, since we, we only got back a week before last. And, um, and I didn't know, I didn't read the, the material on the back really carefully until last night. And I was so thrilled to find 
this image. I thought, well, I have to, you know, get that into the slide presentation. Yeah, I know. And it's and I looked up the city hall, and that was when I realized that this is the one that's standing now. It is not the original one that would have been there. Um, but I could see in the in the picture and and Google Earth or Wikipedia <laughs> that there was some big green thing, and I was hoping it was a magnolia. Darn. <laughs> I, uh, there might be magnolia. I wonder on the terracotta of 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 Oakland City Hall. I'll actually check that out for you because magnolias were definitely trees that were quite beloved in Oakland, and and there are still really beautiful magnolias all over town. So, oh, that would be great. I'll email yeah. you. That would that that would be great. She also a lot of her paintings are of of plants that you know don't live here I mean they're they're from Ireland or whatever and then when you look at the notes on the back it turns out that she went to the conservatory park and <laughs> and did paintings there so that's that's cool. pretty interesting okay there's one more question did they own the house on telegraph if so how did they find the funds from Rachel Bradley Good question. They did own the house. And finally, finally in their, I guess they were at that point in their late 60s. I don't know where the funds came from. Um, Sarah had had somehow managed to buy land in Santa Barbara. They did also eventually sell the land in Shalam that they homesteaded. Um, and But also she had some support from her family. Um, she had her older brother was very disapproving of their lifestyle and he just thought these these people are just ridiculous playing you know with plants and and you know living in the dirt and he just didn't get the idea of people being botanists but he did send her money um when they when the cabin burned or when their tent burned it also burned all their money and and he sent it's in the book. I've forgotten exactly how much it was, but she was very, very grateful. He's very disapproving, but also very loyal. So that may be where some of the money came from. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions, so uh, we could wait for someone to think one up or whatever. Allison, are you able to? I am. Okay. Wynn, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. It it really is delightful. And her art adds so much. And the saga of tracking <clears throat> down her art and preserving it and and uh, <laughs> wading through the cross writing in all <laughs> those that correspondence. It's just um, really been a labor of love that you've done and and it's a it's a remarkable story that we're very grateful to you for sharing with us and so thank you very much for oh, well thank yeah. you very fun to talk to people in Oakland of all of all places <laughs> and I certainly appreciate it well it's been wonderful for us are there any other questions from anybody that we have? Any questions, Charles? Can you see anybody else? I, I don't see any. Okay. All righty. Well, thank you everyone for showing up and coming. And this will be archived on our website under events. And so it will probably take a couple weeks for the final, um, you know, work Listing. to be done on it before it's posted but um it's 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 been it's been a lovely presentation win oh, and it's thank a you. great thank you. it's a it's a great book it really is if you haven't read the book i highly encourage it it is in the library um so you can get it there and it's um uh, and but it's beautiful and it's beautifully illustrated so it really helps her come alive and um she is buried in um, Mountain View Cemetery, kind of off to the right on the bluff, kind of not too far from the parties and uh, and Anthony Chabot. So 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really, I really appreciate it. And, and it's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night.